Já mám pro vás ještě další dvě organizační informace. Vyplněné evaluční dotazníky, které jste dostali na svých místech, tak prosím pak házejte do té papírové krabice, co je u vchodu. Budeme vám moc vděčný, pokud ty dotazníky vyplníte. Druhá informace je, že jsme našli dvě jmenovky, takže pokud nikdo z vás ji ztratil, tak je u prezenčních listin. A třetí informace je, že teďka ještě budeme chvíli pokračovat s panelem, který jsme měli před obědem, 15 minut, a potom se panely vymění a budeme pokračovat s tím posledním. A já bych teď předala slovo panu Danielu Bartoniovi, který vyučuje na Evangelické teologické fakultě Univerzity Karlovy a je také advokátem obětí násilí. Děkuji. Dobré odpoledne, dámy a pánové. Máme tedy asi 15 minut teď na to, aby jsme využili přítomnosti těch panelistů z toho dopoledního panelu. Takže pokud máte nějaké otázky na ně ještě, tak klidně pište do té, do té aplikace. Po případě je tady někdo, kdo by chtěl vznést dotaz ústně na mikrofon? Nikoho nevidím, tak v tom případě se pustíme do těch otázek, které máme před sebou. There is a question on the uh, position of uh, churches, the Catholic Church and uh, potentially other religious communities. Um, as uh, uh, when it came to the ratification of the Istanbul Convention or when it comes to uh, the Istanbul Convention itself. Uh, would somebody like to uh, comment if there was some interesting uh, uh, topics raised by the, uh, by the churches or religious communities when it comes to uh, the Istanbul Convention and its ratification process? Doesn't seem so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe, they, maybe in Austria. Well, no, actually, no, because there's nothing. I think that's the same with all of us. That there's nothing in, um, special to be said because it was not uh, controversial. Thank okay. Thank you. Um, then there was a question: uh, if there was uh, any kind of uh, um, campaign. Uh, in favor or uh, awareness raising campaign uh, when it comes to ratification of the Istanbul Convention. Uh, did your governments campaign somehow for or against the uh, Istanbul Convention? Was there, was there any kind of public uh, uh, or broad public discussion um, before the ratification? Not in Austria. No. Not, in, Not Austria. in Serbia. No. <laughs> yeah, just just by the uh, um, by the facial expressions and uh, also by uh, by some of the voices, it, it doesn't seem that uh, uh, the other countries would have experienced a similar thing to what the Czech Republic uh, uh, has been experiencing over the past uh, year uh, or year and a half. And there is a question um, of male uh, or about male victims. Um, do your countries apply uh, all relevant provisions to men? Because I, I think it, it needs to be said. The question is asking about all provisions to men. Obviously, this this can't be uh, true for the provisions that are directed to, to women only. But when it comes to men. Um, Is, is there anything that uh, that you would like to uh, uh, to share in this this respect? Yeah, <laughs> too many gadgets. So, uh, of course, all provisions are applied to male victims. Um, but when we talk about shelters and emergency places, uh, these responses are uh, separated. So uh, shelters are uh, all shelters. There are two types of shelters: shelters for women. The, it's the, they are now 
39 all over the country and one shelter for male victims. Um, and uh, the same for emergency places, they are separated by sex. Uh, all, all, the, all the other services, helplines, of course the criminal code are applied equal uh, for men and women. Thank you for that. If I can just add, uh, just to remind us that uh, the Istanbul Convention was actually adopted uh, uh, and uh, it's applying predominantly to women because of this unequal position of uh, power between uh, men and women and uh, the research and findings across Europe that uh, women are more exposed uh, uh, due to that um, uh, subordinate position to violence and that is the main purpose of the Convention. Of course it does apply to other categories as well. But I mean, this was the main reason and then in different countries, in, uh, in Serbia for example, it applies predominantly to women because they are more victims of violence than, than men. No, oh, domestic, yeah, the other. I had also um, a question over lunch, if, if, if there is uh, uh, data uh, or any kind of relevant data uh, in your countries that uh, it would uh, uh, show that uh, women are uh, predominantly the, the victims and uh, if, uh, uh, if, if you can for example say uh, based on your uh, national experience to, to what extent uh, well, if, if you look uh, at the statistics, like every third woman, a woman was uh, a, like a victim of violence, any form of violence during her life. And every uh, second uh, um, um, uh, was uh, uh, exposed to um, any form of psychological violence. And the problem is, for example, with psychological violence uh, that sometimes uh, is not recognized as violence at all. So this is just what we need to raise awareness about uh, uh, like, uh, uh, and then uh, this is what we actually are doing because, uh, uh, like, um, uh, we had, uh, for example, uh, we made um, like um, you know, a s small uh, movie uh, which was uh, actually broadcasted uh, uh, during the 16 days of activism against violence against women, and that was uh, called Sil Silence Witness, uh, and it was just uh, actually um, in 3D you could look how psychological violence actually looks like and then you, you put uh, the, you know, uh, the, the go um, um, like spectacles or whatever, all this, and then you are in that room where the woman is exposed to violence. And then uh, it gradually goes on about how it is actually affecting her and whether initially she's even aware that she's exposed to violence. And uh, this is the situation it, uh, like, um, that in a lot of cases, that's why they are not reported or they are underreported because the victim actually doesn't really recognize the situation. And um, uh, same goes for for sexism, for example, and that's why, I mean, we mentioned the Council of Europe recommendation of sexism uh, uh, that first actually has the definition of sexism as such. Uh, so it is very important to, 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 to actually recognize the situation and talk uh, about it and to raise awareness what it is in order uh, to, to um, uh, fight it. And then usually it starts from there, move on to more violent, uh, types of behavior. In Serbia, for example, any form of violence and against, uh, uh, I mean, it's actually, I mean, it's forbidden by law, but still, that's um, uh, on the legal basis. But de facto, I mean, this is the situation in uh, many countries, although we, I mean, it is happening. So what we are actually doing, uh, we are trying to uh, implement what's already there to, to add additional measures and whether they are affirmative or other sort of measures in order to 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 have this uh, to uh, to to um, not to have it at all actually to uh, to uh, line up de facto and uh, uh, legal you know situations so I mean that's basically it that's that's what you do yep thank you for that uh, um any more uh, comments on the or uh, insights on the data uh, 
I just want to maybe uh, one form of violence is uh, the most extreme murder. If you look at data on on killings of uh, women and men, I, um, you see and and the analysis of the causes of these killings. You there you you get a clear picture of how of of gender differences. Uh, because uh, killings of women are mo most often um, um, inflicted uh, by their partners or ex-partners or family members, whereas uh, killings of men um, are most often not based on these uh, reasons. So there, I think this this uh, shows very very clearly the differences in. The motive, mo motives for violence and uh, how men and women are affected differently. I might have uh, one more related question on the on the data collection. Um, has the Istanbul Convention and the uh, the process uh, um, uh, then with uh, Gravy uh, with the monitoring uh, helped you with uh, collecting data uh, um, on your local? Uh, problems with violence and uh, has it helped you also with uh, then uh, shaping your local policies uh, uh, so that they uh, are better tailored to your needs? Well, it's not the ratification itself, but the monitoring process. Uh, when you have the evaluation process, when you have Gravio asking for so many, so many data, uh, you have two options. Um, you realize you don't have that data and you work to, to, to get them, uh, or you don't, um, are, you don't fit the, the demands of the Gravio evaluation. So when you face an evaluation like this, that, it, that is very, very um, existent and very, uh, uh, very detailed, um, you realize that the data you collect and you work on maybe are not enough. So you start to think about statistics and administrative data and on the other on the other perspective, so it's yeah it's a push. It's a very uh, really important push to organize your national statistics on these issues. And have you have you found these uh, uh, demands uh, useful, or has it been a burden for um, your country and your country's budgets? These demands are absolutely um, fair and absolutely uh, structural to define the priorities. Uh, that's why an uh, evaluation process of this kind uh, must, be, must be seen as a privilege to the country and not, uh, and not only um, a group of someone uh, outside the country that came to, to tell you what is wrong. So if you see this uh, evaluation process as um, as an opportunity, uh, it's a it's a very um, important moment. Yep. Uh, we could improve our data uh, with the help of the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. Uh, since four years, we have new data about um, the relationship between the victim and the per perpetrator. So. We know that, for example, in 2017, about 150,000 uh, women were affected by violence against uh, themselves, and um, every third day a woman is killed by her partner or ex-partner. So, and this uh, hel helps uh, to raise the awareness in the uh, society. And uh, yeah, I think the data are very important. Thank you, Franz. Yeah, for France, uh, I would add, I uh, agree with my, my colleague. Um, in France, we are actually creating a database um, based on the, the question of the, the Gravio Committee. So uh, we, 
um, we are creating a database on violence and gender violences and this database will would uh, feed uh, all the policies we will uh, all the actions we will uh, we will put in uh, in in country in in the year uh, and Moreover, um, this database uh, can help to communicate uh, on the policies we are um, we are making actually uh, with uh, numbers we didn't have uh, before, and we have no, and we can communicate in all the country. Thank you. There was already a, uh, an issue of sexism mentioned, and. Uh, uh, it's also included in one of the questions uh, um, whether uh, your countries uh, criminalize uh, um, all forms of sexual violence, uh, including sexual harassment or, or sexist jokes. Um, that, I, I think, requires also a bit of explanation of uh, 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 the Czech context where uh, there have been um, concerns uh, uh, that uh, the Istanbul Convention might uh, um, make uh, ordinary life uh, impossible for many people because they, they, they wouldn't be allowed to joke about uh, things that they, they joke about uh, every day. Um, like, uh, and they, they couldn't, uh, couldn't have, for example, sexist jokes or, or there, there can't be, for example, uh, traditions that, uh, that have some kind of sexist uh, element to them. Uh, for example, um, Easter traditions in the, uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, so um, I think the, these, uh, this needs to be, I, I think the question needs to be understood in, uh, in this, uh, this respect. So um, how, do you, uh, how do you work with uh, uh, the sexist uh, element uh, uh, in your countries? Um, I, reminded, I reminded this morning that uh, we took um, the first law against uh, uh, sexist aggressions were, was taken in 1980 uh, against, against rape and 1992 against uh, sexual harassment and the year before in 2018 we took a law um, uh, to, to make um, to, to, to fight against uh, sexist insults in the street or in public transport. So, so we are, uh, thanks to the, um, the Istanbul Convention, we are uh, acting against um, sexist insults. Well, in Austria, uh, sexual harassment, verbal, I think that's the question, verbal sexual harassment. Verbal, it's not, exactly. It's not criminalized. You can still make jokes. Um, but um, if, like, in the workplace, if th this, there are laws in place that uh, also would sanction, not criminalize, but sanction um, verbal um, jokes that um, harass um, in a situation of dependency, because at workplace, uh, dependency is a big issue. And if this is, um, um, if, if someone is put under pressure, if someone can't, can't um, it's not on an equal, equal power balance. And, it, the, and then a situation, it depends on the si concrete situation, then uh, is, uh, verbal, verbal jokes, could be sanctioned, but not criminalized. This would be uh, like uh, um, sh the, 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 the boss of that uh, employee should uh, reprimand um, the employee, and uh, or in, it could also lead to some form of uh, financial um, sanction. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, it would be the same like um, in Serbia, like uh, for example, if you have a sexist remark, you have a politician, a woman politician, who is actually talking about certain issues, and the only comments that you get is just how she's looking like, whether she's ugly or whether she's not, how she's dressed, whether it's this or that, and you really don't get it. 
uh, such remarks when uh, the men are in case and then it's happening over time then that politician for example um, she's losing her credibility in the sense that she's viewed in that and perceived in that way and if it's uh, of course uh, undermining her position you know and that is just something which is not acceptable and that is something that ought to be changed so that you when you are talking about certain subjects or certain topic that you are uh, considered on the equal footing and not really commenting on something which is totally irrelevant and based of your uh, like um, gender so that's that's the gist it, of it. it's not done through the criminal law but it's, uh, it's it's sanctioned in the sense not not like not in the criminal law, but harassment of course it is and especially if it's happening in the workplace i mean it's just a different yep. thank you no more comments. If there are no more comments, uh, um, I would like to thank the uh, panelists of the morning panel for their uh, availability and uh, uh, answers to the questions uh, from the floor. Um, and uh, uh, if you want to stay in here, you can, you can still uh, stay and contribute. And uh, we will move our focus to the uh, panel that uh, you've got on your programs as uh, the afternoon's panel, uh, which uh, is going to uh, uh, continue. It, it contains people that uh, 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 are similarly countries' representatives. Uh, so uh, we have. Uh, uh, Olaf Lorin from Sweden, uh, who's uh, uh, going to uh, explain us uh, uh, the Swedish position on uh, on these issues. Um, then um, we have uh, Deborah Bergamini, uh, who's uh, uh, in a in a more s uh, specific position because she, she's not a representative of the government, uh, uh, but she's. Uh, 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 she's uh, an Italian member of parliament and uh, pal uh, the member of parliament also of the parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe, if I get it correct. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, uh, the honor to, uh, to have two persons from uh, the Council of Europe. Uh, one is uh, uh, Claudia Luciani, uh, who is the director of human dignity, equality and uh, government governance. And uh, uh, then we have uh, uh, Feride uh, Achar, who's uh, uh, the former director of uh, uh, Gravio, the uh, body that uh, 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 is charged with monitoring the uh, Istanbul Convention. Uh, so uh, we can uh, we can have uh, insights, I think, from from very different perspectives uh, in this afternoon's panel. Uh, so I think if, if we want to continue where we started in the in the morning, I would uh, ask Olaf Florin to um, give his uh, uh, insights in uh, the time of three minutes, if I may. This is yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'm a non-political advisor to Sweden's Minister for Gender Equality and I also coordinate the Swedish National Strategy for Preventing and Combating Men's Violence Against Women within the government offices. Thank you so much for having invited me. I've learned that many Czechs do not know what the Istanbul Convention is all about. And uh, I think that the situation may be similar in Sweden. My own mother, for one, had no idea what the Istanbul Convention is. She thought it had something to do with archaeology and protecting the cultural heritage. But uh, there is very strong support for the contents of the convention. We know for a fact that 85% of adult Swedes think that it is a rather good idea to create a society of increased equality between, between women and men in Sweden. Uh, this is for uh, 2018 and we know since these are regular opinion polls that the number has steadily grown in the past 20 years and the majority of men think this too and um, the difference between men and women is diminishing. 
We also know that uh, the support for the Swedish ban on corporal punishment of children, which was passed in the late 70s, has very strong support. It has been surveyed regularly over the years. We don't have um, corresponding surveys when it comes to violence against women and domestic violence, but there is good reason to believe that uh, the Swedish general public is uh, massively in favor of freedom from violence for women and freedom from domestic violence. Um, the Swedish government and the Swedish parliament has a specific goal on ending violence against women since 1994. Uh, there were debates on violence against women in the 1970s and the 1980s leading up to this uh, specific uh, goal of gender equality. But uh, preceding the Sweden's ratification of the Istanbul Convention in 2014, there was very little debate. Uh, and uh, I think um, that people would probably have regarded the convention as um, a given, uh, rather harmless. Uh, of course, we're in support of such convention. But there has been some local debates uh, referring to the convention as an important international standard. For instance, uh, in municipalities where women's shelters um, are um, referring to Sweden's obligations under the Istanbul Convention, when they uh, want the municipality to spend, invest more in, in local shelters, or, um, um, and, and there are some other similar examples. There has been a considerable debate on the need for EU accession to the convention, and uh, concerns about ill-informed resistance to the convention in the rest of Europe. Sweden ratified the convention in 2014 and was also subject to uh, uh, an evaluation process in 2017, to 2018. And um, Grevio, the expert group uh, for the convention, um, did issue 51 recommendations in total to Sweden, nine of them urging uh, Sweden to take immediate action to bring the legislation or policy into compliance with the convention. And 20 recommendations um, were of the nature strongly encourages that shortcomings need to be remedied in the near future. So in total, 51 recommendations. And uh, I would say that the government has currently uh, measures or um, has um, announced that measures will be taken for the majority of these 51 recommendations. Um, the evaluation process and the ratification has already had an impact on uh, the Swedish legal uh, Swedish legal framework and, and the Swedish practice uh, in reviewing uh, Sweden's to what extent the Swedish um, legal framework and, and policy practice um, corresponds to the convention, the government found it um, necessary to propose legal changes expanding the scope of restraining orders in cases where the parties involved have a joint permanent residence, uh, lowering the threshold, making it easier to issue such orders. 
uh, and uh, also introducing new penal code provisions against marriage coercion as well as decepting uh, by deception inducing someone to travel abroad with the purpose of forcing them to enter into marriage uh, and to further limiting the possibilities of recognizing marriages of persons aged under 18. Uh, after the evaluation process, Sweden, uh, uh, the government has commissioned a specific survey on uh, gender equality in the indigenous uh, Sami population, which was um, a problem uh, pointed to by Grevio. Uh, the government has also decided to review the Swedish system of restraining and protection orders to look at um, uh, the current system in light of Grevio's recommendations. Uh, and uh, as of last year, Sweden has have a new sexual offences legislation based on the principle of consent. Uh, it was not decided with explicit reference to the Istanbul Convention, but it is thoroughly in line with uh, the Convention. So why is it important to ratify and take measures giving effect to the provisions of the Istanbul Convention? Uh, I think that um, the convention is comparatively specific and comprehensive. So it offers a valuable checklist, a roadmap, and device for follow-up. This area has, among other things, been characterized by multiple perspectives and differing views of key concepts. So therefore, I think the convention offers a very valuable common terminology. Also, all across the world, the problem of violence against women and domestic violence has been recognized and dealt with mainly by civil society, not least women's shelters and child rights organizations. I th think that they still carry a disproportionate burden. The public sector needs to step in, including the judicial system, of course, as well as social services and the healthcare sector, because they have authority and power to do much more. And the Istanbul uh, Convention is important in this regard. The if Istanbul could, Convention... If I, if I may ask you to sum up, please. Yes. It also offers a comprehensive framework for integrated policies that could guide and facilitate more in-depth collaboration between EU members in our efforts to achieve national as well as international goals of ending violence against women. On a personal note, I think the Istanbul Convention is a, a great tool for promoting sound, healthy, inclusive family values. Because uh, if we want to uh, reduce the level of uh, divorces, for instance, then we need non-violent men. We need non-violent relationships, uh, including for children. We must remember that children who grow up with domestic violence, they run a much higher risk of becoming perpetrators or becoming victimized again later in life. So in order to break the vicious cycle of violence in the long term, we need to collaborate and um, within the framework of the Istanbul Convention. Thank you. Um, thank you for... Um uh, sharing your experience. Um, I would ask uh, uh, us to be uh, as brief and concise as, as we can be because I got the information that uh, um, we will have to finish um, uh, this conference uh, at uh, uh, 10 to 3. So that's, that's the time that we've got and uh, uh, we should use it uh, uh, to our best. So I will uh, pass the floor uh, to Deborah Bergamini. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to join this very important meeting. I'm very sorry that I couldn't attend in the morning. I just arrived from Italy, but in my country today and tomorrow there will be a very important uh, passage in the history of our democracy because we are voting pro or against 
a strong reduction on the number of uh, parliamentarians. And there's a huge, huge debate, and uh, I really wanted to be here, but at the same time, I will have to be present tomorrow, because if I don't vote, yes or no, I will be killed, certainly. <laughs> so I need to be back. <laughs> um, I arrived in the parliament first time in 2008. So it was not in the, in the last century, it was a number of years ago. That day was one of, has been one of the most important, amazing days in my life. I felt all the emotion of getting into the place of democracy. And uh, I really wanted to do my job at the best. The day after reading the papers, I found pictures of myself and other women colleagues of mine with comments with respect to how we were dressed, the color of our tires, and the, and the heels, whether they were high or low heels. And I thought, well, there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> Certainly, there's a lot of work to be done. Since then, I've been quite active uh, with respect to women's issues. I became a member of the Council of Europe Assembly. I'm the Italian parliamentarian uh, in the network of the Council of Europe Against Women. And uh, when the Istanbul Convention was put at the, at the si signature of the countries of the Council of Europe, I definitely wanted my country to be one of the first to sign it and ratify it. I thought it would be very important for the Council of Europe, for the whole issue of domestic violence, but would be very important also for my country and for civilization in my country, no rhetoric. I just thought that it was the right thing to do. That happened, the ratification happened, Italy was the fifth country to ratify it in 2013. Not an easy task though. At the time, the conflict between left and center-right in the parliament and in the country was really harsh. The conflict was real, was not formal. And I was a member of a party belonging to the center-right. At the time, it was very difficult to have any form of constructive contact with members, parliamentarians of the other side. Luckily enough, though, I found a person on the other <laughs> party, Federica Mogherini, who soon would become high uh, representative for foreign um, policy in the European Union, who was, as I was, convinced that ratifying the Convention of Istanbul would be an important step for the culture in our country. So we decided to work together. Not an easy thing again, but we did it. The ratification of the Istanbul Convention became a trans transversal um, process. Women in the parliament became active, no matter which party they belonged to, because that became a symbolic battle. Uh, of course, I'm not getting into the quality of the text of the Istanbul Convention here. You did this morning, many experts discussed about that. And it is true that as the mother of the Swedish minister in Italy, nobody knows the text of the Convention of Istanbul. But I can tell you one thing, that that ratification popped up a huge debate, a national debate, with many, many consequences. Because not everybody was happy about the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. As anything in life, some people were pro, some people were against. There was an issue concerning the definition of gender. And a part of the Catholic representatives, and we were in Italy, I underline in Italy, where the Vatican is, not in Italy, but inside Italy, uh, not everybody was happy. There was a huge debate. There were criticism. But what we happened to do was something that I think politicians should do always. We had a strong will. We were convinced that you never earn an effect 100% perfect. And the Convention of Istanbul maybe is not perfect. Maybe there were things that I would not perfectly agree with. But the aim of the ratification of the Convention was so important because it has to do with the physical integrity of women. 
There's no human rights unless you have your physical integrity assured. So the aim was so big, so important. Domestic violence, an issue not spoken about ever, hidden, but so frequent. Any level, social level, any geography, it's everywhere. That we thought that even if there were criticisms, even if it was difficult, even if we had to overcome critics, and we did, still that would have been an important step for increased civilization. And one other aspect that was very important is that in Istanbul Convention was the first legally binding instrument to prevent domestic violence. And it was also the fruit of an intergovernmental, international activity, a push that was very important, again, symbolically. During the process that took us a couple of years, we had seminars exactly like this one in the Chamber of Deputies at the Senate. We had public debates. We had uh, documents and research, and we met many people. We open up, open, 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 listen to everybody. But in the end, we succeeded. We were able to convince the Italian parliament that that was an important moment of civilization in the country. And the, and the signature and then the ratification were chosen unanimously. At a moment of very high conflict, political conflict in Italy. So I'm very proud. Now you ask, what after six years, what are the outcomes? Well, the outcomes are that domestic violence is still there, of course. You don't expect to kill domestic violence in six years after a ratification. But certainly there are more women that are ready to denounce and to speak out if something wrong happens in their houses. And this is a result, objective one. There has also been a huge debate with respect to the way women are represented through stereotypes. And here, media have a huge responsibility. And the debate was born after the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. And many media, um, many media players were obliged to come to the parliament and discuss and try to set up a code of conduct. Because you, if you ask yourself, I always ask myself, which is the main instinct of the human being? Sometimes I feel like that the main instinct of human being is obedience. Sometimes I feel that the main instinct of human beings is freedom. But the more I grow old, the more I believe that the, main, the first instinct of human being is emulation. And emulation is so important. If you don't provide a civilization with good examples, you will not have a good civilization. So my feeling is that the ratification of the Istanbul Convention helped us in really changing, starting to change some behavior, some habit of thinking that is still ongoing. And this is why I feel like in the respect of the complexities of each single country belonging to the Council of Europe, I understand the complexity of politics, I understand the complexity of national societies. Still, I feel in my heart that I, I think it's to encourage the ratification of this convention. Because certainly, it puts attention on an issue that otherwise would be, unfortunately, again, either forgotten or hidden. And I don't think that physical integrity of women should ever be hidden or forgotten. Thank you. And... Uh... It seems that the Italian story has been quite uh, touching for all the audience. And uh, now we will move to the Council of Europe and uh, I will ask uh, Farida Ajar to uh, share her experience as uh, uh, the person uh, who was uh, in charge of monitoring uh, uh, the Istanbul Convention of, over the past few years. 
Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for organizing this, which is really a true exercise in democratic governing, I would say, so that I, I appreciate very much. Now, I will be, uh, I had a longer uh, presentation <laughs> prepared, but I will not go into that because a lot of it has already been uh, also taken up with regard to the Istanbul Convention. And if there are further questions which I see on the board, then I can go and clarify some, some of those uh, later on. Right now, what I would like to do is talk about the work of Gravio, because I, I think we have uh, less opportunity to do that. Now, uh, I have had the honor and the privilege of being the first president of Bravio for uh, four years, during which most of the uh, country reports that uh, um, we have been talking about since the morning were presented to Gravio, and uh, Gravio's comments and the committee of the party's recommendations uh, were submitted. So this was really a very, I think, um, historic experience in a sense. And uh what is Gravio? Gravio is a group that consists of 15 independent experts. So to make things clear, I'm an independent expert. I am not Council of Europe staff. Uh, these 15 um, independent experts are 12 women and three men at the present. And they come from different countries with varied professional backgrounds. Some are academics, judges, prosecutors, civil society activists, some with uh, significant significant international experience beforehand, others with strictly domestic exposure to, to the subject. They are nominated by their states and they are elected by the parties to the Istanbul Convention for four-year terms. Gravio conducts its monitoring on the basis of the information it receives primarily from the state authorities as responses to the baseline questionnaire that Gravio sends to the uh, states. It then also receives information with the, uh, through the dialogues it holds with states authorities and the observations members of Gravio make when they have a country visit to the country under monitoring. And uh, most importantly, Gravio also receives information from the NGOs and other sources in the country and um, outside. The reports of other international monitoring bodies and processes, such as the CEDO committee's reports, the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence's uh, work, the Universal Periodic Review that goes on in the uh, United Nations, also feed into the process of giving information to uh, Gravio. This information is analyzed to form the basis of Gravio's draft report, which is then sent to the uh, state for comments, and following the state's comments to this draft text, the report is published as a public document. This is what you have in the ca case of countries that, that have been uh, monitored as uh, Gravio's report. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, this public document, the existing, uh, with regards to this document, in the existing practice and according to the Istanbul Convention, it then goes to the political organ of the monitoring and evaluation process, which is the Committee of the Parties, and the Committee of the Parties, under the present circumstances, endorses the Gravio's report as a whole and formally communicates the recommendations as prioritized by Gravio to the state's concerns. So, uh, so far, I'm happy to tell you that this has been working, this process has been working like clockwise, uh, clockwork, owing to the commitment of both the independent experts and the representatives the committee, uh, in the committee of the parties to the essence and uh, the, uh, the meaning of the convention. Uh, where the, there is a meeting of minds, a very uh, um, you know, good result comes out, and this is what's been happening here. The monitoring approach and the recommendations of Gravio largely, I have to tell you, correspond to those of the UN CEDO committees. Uh, in many cases, with essentially similar recommendations, I may I have the uh, moment to refer you to the concluding observations of CEDO committee to the sixth periodic report of the Czech Republic in uh, paragraph 16 and 19 in 2016. 
2016, when Czech Republic presented its last report to the United Nations Committee uh, for that convention, and paragraphs 16 to 19 essentially encapsulate the Istanbul Convention's uh, so-called, unquote, uh, demands. However, the, there is an added value to Gravio's recommendations, and that is that while CEDO and other global human rights bodies, owing partly to the very wide landscape they need to cover, formulate rather general recommendations uh, and give them to the states, and the states are then expected to translate those into specific and concrete policies and actions. Now, owing to the nature of the Istanbul Convention, its added value is that Gradio's recommendations are very concrete, clear, and easy to follow. And they provide prioritization of the uh, steps to be taken in terms of a specific time frame. This is really making th things easier as far as implementation of the state goals. The monitoring reports of Gravio provide a clear and operable, as was said earlier, roadmap uh, for states. Almost, I like to call it a recipe. These texts are not vague and they're not obscure or too general. So the state has no difficulty to translate them into concrete policies and measures, that is, if there is a political will to do so. Uh, Gravel's reports have been very well received, and I'm very pleased to share with you, by states and civil society alike so far. We have been listening to testimony from many uh, countries since this morning about how beneficial these reports and recommendations have been for those, to, uh, for those states to progress their uh, reports on the on this area. Now, uh, Gravio reports are also very well received by other monitoring and political mechanisms at the global level. For example, the uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Violence and the CEDAW Committee itself builds on Gravio reports now. In fact, uh, Istanbul Convention and Gravio are already inspiring other international mechanisms around the world. In 2017, I'm happy to tell you, as a country that has ratified uh, the CEDAW Convention, the CEDAW Committee adopted its General Recommendation 35, which is now called Gender-Based Violence Against Women, updating CEDAW General Recommendation 19, Violence Against Women. This latter one was adopted by CEDAW in 1992 and is really the uh, backbone of all the international uh, and the inspiration for all the international national uh, rules and perspectives that developed on violence against women since then. This new CEDAW general recommendation directly respect, uh, reflects the perspective of the Istanbul Convention and is already forming the backbone of the CEDAW Committee's own examination of state reports when it comes to violence against women. So these same issues will come up in CEDAW monitoring as well. Uh, like all well-written recipes, I should say, the Istanbul Convention is clear on principles, but allows for flexibility in implementation. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to the references to, quote, unquote, in accordance with international laws phrase that runs through several articles of the Convention. Thus, uh, the Istanbul Convention allows for and in fact encourages country-specific implementation as the way forward, and uh, that is, of course, keeping in mind and staying loyal to the basic principles of the Convention to have effective implementation. The monitoring of practice of Gravio has also followed this flexible approach. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me just say that uh, Gravio monitoring so far has shown that everywhere there is a strong support for protection of women from violence. The challenge is for many societies accepting the structural link between gender inequality and violence against women. And we've been discussing that earlier this morning to some extent about gender inequality and violence against women link in the Istanbul Convention. And if there are further questions, I'll be happy to go back to that. Now, uh, 
if I may ask I know you you're looking in my eye, but I <laughs> this is a mad rush to... Uh, well, we have to realize that gaining ground requires changing attitudes, as we have, uh, and that takes time. But uh, what makes it even more complex, and I want to underline this, is the spreading of false narratives about the convention, the baseless fears that ratifying and implementing the Istanbul Convention would put traditional values, the family institution, or even national identities at stake. These misconceptions unhinge the discussion from facts and truths, and the Istanbul Convention becomes a hostage of irrational fears particular agendas and domestic political squabbling. Forgive me for saying that. Now, uh, I would like to simply say that Istanbul Convention and its monitoring organ have no bone, that is the monitoring organ, which is Gravio, has no bone to pick with religious beliefs, families, parenthood, education, professional confidentiality, etc., so long as these conform to the basic human rights and civil liberties principles that European states have long agreed to uphold. This is why it's important to ratify the Istanbul Convention. Thank you. Thank you. And now I will ask uh, uh, Claudia Luciani uh, for her remarks. Thank you very much. It's, uh, many things have already been said about the Istanbul Convention and I come from the Secretariat. Uh, so, of course, I'm not going to be uh, telling you not to ratify the Istanbul Convention, but this is not what I wanted to actually suggest this afternoon. I just want to tell you that when um, Commissioner Valkova came to see me in the middle of August, there was nobody in town. It seemed to me that that afternoon it was just me and her discussing um, as two engaged Europeans uh, about how the Council of Europe could help her in her efforts. Uh, with the Parliament um, to explain and to help the discussion to be an informed discussion. So that's why I find myself here today. Um, and in the course of that discussion I realized that of course uh, there were many legitimate questions that maybe at the Secretariat we either take for granted or just think are obviously to be answered in a given way. But discussing with Madda Barkova, who, is, as you know, is a very well-informed and accurate lawyer, uh, we started going uh, through the text. Uh, she and I, we took different versions of different translations of the uh, convention, uh, using uh, the Polish version from my side. She used the Czech. She... So just to tell you that this is not an easy debate when you want to understand really what is at stake. But my first question, a few questions, uh, points I want to share with you. The first question is that in order to do that kind of thing, you first have to read the convention. This little booklet seems thick, but actually there is only 30 pages. You have it in, a, in the without the explanatory, but with it. It can be even shorter. <laughs> okay. So you first have to read. So when she says, she said this morning that many people here who are debating it, have not read it. That worries me a little bit. Why? Because many conventions indeed are signed by states, which means normally they ratify. The intention is they ratify. In this case, of course, it is not a mere technical step, the ratification. It involves discussions, but again, for those discussions to happen in a dispassionate, in a informed way, it starts with reading and concentrating on the substance. And I'm extremely pleased that this meeting today has been just about that. And both uh, uh, voices in favor and voices doubtful have uh, come from informed reading. And I think this should be encouraged. The second point I want to make is that, of course, um, again, judging and having witnessed uh, other ratification processes, there is a time for informed discussion for debates on involving obviously civil society. There is just a stand outside I engage with who is collecting signatures against. Uh, that is of course extremely important to add with the society. Uh, but there's also time for decision making. And that I'm afraid, it has been said before, that requires leadership. We've heard from the, uh, my compatriot, 
that display of leadership is extremely important when it comes to decision making. Because indeed politicians will never be sure if they wait to see the polls whether they get re-elected based on a yes or no pro-Istanbul against Istanbul. At one point, uh, politicians will have to make a call, and hopefully the right one. Uh, the third point I want to make is about how helpful are other experiences. We have had a wealth of information from countries that have ratified, that also those who are like the Czech Republic discussing about ratification. Now, you have both countries that are inside the European Union, countries that are outside the European Union, and two of our member states who have not even signed. That is the Russian Federation and Azerbaijan. Now, I must say that I'm encouraged because in the last few weeks, there is what I call a mini momentum. Uh, the discussion about ratification is, uh, in most of the countries I will mention, happening, uh, of course, as always, in an open way, but is become more serious. So countries that we thought would never really uh, start the process are now interested in Azerbaijan in signing. This was actually expressed uh, at the summit of the country by the president to the president of our parliamentary assembly. Uh, they intend to sign the Istanbul Convention. So this is progress. Um, Armenia. Uh, will have a hearing similar to this with um, their key committees uh, about ratification. Um, the um, Lithuanian parliament is hosting a discussion, hopefully similar to this one. Um, Moldova is engaging in the same way. And uh, I shouldn't forget to mention the European Union is also relaunching the process of ratifying the Istanbul Convention, thanks to the impulse of the new uh, president of the uh, Commission, uh, von der Leyen. So, other experiences, of course, are there. They will never replace your debate, your internal debate. But it is interesting to see that the uh, governance of that debate is similar. The democracy, democratic tenets of that debate are similar. There needs to be an informed debate based on information. And then my final remarks, these are really my personal, when I speak about uh, the convention, I always remind uh, ourselves and my interlocutors that uh, the convention places the victim at the center. We can say whatever we want about uh, possible aims or hidden aims, but if you read Article 1 of that convention, again, go to the text. It is very clear the convention is for victims, and there are many. If we have uh, this very quick calculation that says that on average one third of women have or will experience violence in their life of different sorts, one third. And if women make up half of the population of Europe, then you can say that about 130 million women are going to be one way or another victim of violence. Then I think Istanbul has a very right target. The second point I want to make is that when I hear that Istanbul can squander, can destroy families, it is violence that destroys families and traumatizes kids for life. And finally, this is about, again, not only how NGOs and civil society citizens respond to this phenomenon, but it's about how states, institutions, the ones that are supposed to protect us respond to this challenge. So it is really for states to decide, but they should decide. Thank you. Thank you. We have already uh, collected a few questions and I think the best way to uh, continue would be um, if uh, I could ask anybody who would uh, want to share uh, the most uh, successful outcome or the, the greatest thing that uh, you think that uh, the Istanbul Convention uh, has uh, brought to, uh, to you or that, that you have seen. Um, again, many effects 
um, although these are complex processes that take time, and we know very well how difficult it is the process of preventing domestic violence or in general violence against women and protecting women as well, uh, it is roughly counted that the cost of violence against women in the countries of the Council of Europe uh, amounts to, on a yearly base, to 50 billion euros. So it's also a social cost. Not with, and then there are all the effects. So it's a long time process, but it is important that we start it sooner or later. And one of the main effects of the ratification of the Convention of Istanbul in Italy has been that of, you know, uh, reinforcing the process. Um, promoting a debate, an open debate, on violence against women, and more generally issues regarding women that, has, that have never been a priority in the agenda of governments, no matter which color. But the effort that was uh, undergone uh, through the ratification of the Convention of, uh, Convention of Istanbul certainly helped this process to be, again, to be reinforced, to be stronger. Uh, it also promoted a more open debate, as I said before, with respect to the stereotyped ways in which women are depicted. Uh, in my country, in year 2019, I mean, third millennium, still there are stereotypes that are so difficult to, uh, to be <laughs> deconstructed, so difficult. Now, you ask me, is the phenomenon of violence against women better today? Not sure. Certainly, there are more cases that are denounced. So maybe, optimistic way, <laughs> or perception, maybe uh, the instrument given by the Convention of Istanbul has helped women to be more daring in speaking out. Certainly there is a pressure in, in governments to devote economic resources to one of the P's. You know that there, there's these three P's of the Convention of Istanbul prevention, protection, and prosecution. So there's a stronger pressure on governments to put on more economic, financial resources onto the protection of women who undergo violence uh, through the anti-violence centers and, and so on. And last aspect, that is for sure, there's a more conscious approach with respect to what education can can make, how education can make a difference, especially today in times where stereotypes and emulation are much more easy to propagate through the social, through the web. So we have that aspect to, to take into consideration. So giving more resources, not only economic resources, financial resources to protection of women who have undergone violence, but also using education, schools, education, as a place where you learn how to combat stereotypes, not to become a victim of stereotypes. That is something that from 2013 to today, I can perceive clearly that in Italy have changed. Now, it's maybe not all the merit of the uh, Convention of Istanbul, of course. There are processes, social processes that happen. But still, uh, I think that that happened. Last thing I wanted to say, um, we were having lunch together and I, I was thinking this. In 2013, we were able to ratify the Convention of, of Istanbul in Italy. If this had to happen today, I'm not so sure that it could have succeeded, that we could have succeeded in the same way. It would have been probably more difficult year 2019. Because what I've seen in these six years is a change in the, in the way politics are seen and a much more superficial approach to the complexity of problems. Today we have a yes or no answer uh, and we politicians tend to think that to build up your own consensus you have to speak simple and you have to be simple and you have to propose simple solutions. But I've never seen a simple problem. 
in my career as politician. So I think that uh, this is another aspect to be kept into consideration, that we have to be very careful not to instrumentalize the meaning of the Convention of Istanbul for political reasons, one part of the ad or the other. That would be a damage to a progress of a civilization for understandable but political interests that, in my opinion, are secondary to the big aim of the Convention. Thank you. Uh, any other success stories that you would like to share? If not, uh, I will uh, pass the mic to the floor. Děkuji. Jestli se mohu zeptat takto švédského experta, počkám na sluchátka. Já mám otázku na švédského panelistu, případně expertku z Německa nebo i další, kteří budou se cítit dotazem o Sloveni. Do vašich zemí přichází lidé z jiných kulturních okruhů a přinášejí si možná s sebou i některé projevy související tedy s ženskou integritou, které jsou v rozporu s istambulskou úmluvou. Mám na mysli například vynucené sňatky mladistvých, nezletilých nevě nebo vynucené zásahy na ženských pohlavních orgánech. To je vše v rozporu s istambulskou úmluvou. Znamená to, že v vašich zemích, pokud se vyskytují takové jevy, je to tvrdě potíráno, stíháno, mají tedy úřady na to dosah, anebo kde není žalobce, není soudce. To znamená, že se to děje, víte, že se to ve vašich zemích děje, ale nikdo to nenahlásí a nikdo to tedy tím pádem ani neeviduje statisticky a je to vlastně v té šedé zóně. Děkuji. The government has recently taken a series of measures against forced marriage, child marriage and other crimes committed in the name of honor. Um, but as you um, are implying, uh, it is very difficult to identify and help victims and prosecute the offenders because uh, these may be very tightly knit communities where um, if you try to support the victim you may actually face um, you may face threats yourself a very common a very um, well-known case in Sweden uh, a couple of years ago concerned a father, uh, a middle-aged father who was killed uh, during a fishing uh, trip because he refused to raise his teenage daughters in, according, in accordance with um, a specific tradition on her related. Um, so um, this is uh, a challenge. Uh, the Swedish police has recently started to record cases uh, where there is suspicion of honor-related motives, but it is difficult because these crimes uh, can be committed uh, for other motives. So uh, it is difficult to produce reliable crime statistics on uh, honor-related uh, crimes. There is also um, uh, a government uh, committee of inquiry looking into the possibility of further um, measures of criminal justice in this area. But um, uh, I, I think that we need to build trust with uh, the victims. I think that segregation at large is uh, a problem that um, we need to deal with in this uh, respect so that th there are no uh, uh, parallel micro societies with entirely different uh, values being developed within Sweden. Yeah. Thank you. I've seen some of the new Novakovo. Krátký dotaz, prosím. Děkuji. Já bych 
než vznesu šest krátkých dotazů, tak, tak ne, bych... Jedna, tak bych jenom jedna osoba, jeden, maximálně dva dotazy. Dobře, tak já bych jenom podotkla, že by bylo dobré, abyste věděli, že nejste v zemi, kde lidé si nepřečetli istambulskou umluvu. Já sama mluvím za 20 tisíc lidí, kteří podepsali petici proti ratifikaci a vždycky to podepsali po důkladném zvážení. Za druhé bych chtěla říci, že si velmi vážím toho odvahy paní profesorky Válkové, která skutečně teď se zdá nastartovala regulérní a seriózní diskusy. Těch pět let, které máme v průměru jako spoždění od té doby, než jsme že jsme neratifikovali Istanbulskou umluvu na rozdíl od ostatních států, jsou e, pro nás velice důležité, protože my jsme mohli pozorovat různé dopady. Zača- už tady už diskuse probíhala a e, m, důležité je, že my už víme e, od roku od září 2017, jak chápe e, Istanbulskou umluvu a její implementaci Evropsk- Evropská unie, respektive Evropský parlament, protože je jasně řečeno spousta věcí, v usnesení Evropského parlamentu. A paní, teprve po dvou letech paní profesorka Válková se, odhod, se odhodlala, slučnost. ano, se on, no, my jsme zrovna ty, kteří spolu debatují uh, už dva roky. <laughs> teprve po dvou letech se paní profesorka Válková odhodlala začít plnit ten úkol, který, nebo tu výzvu Evropského parlamentu, aby začala diskusy. A ta diskuse, ta diskuse vyzývá k tomu, aby byl vysvětlen vzim které dosud neratifikovali pojem gender a zejména pojem genderová identita, protože tento pojem se jinak v celém textu vůbec nevyskytuje. Tudíž dotaz, proč tam je. Paní, ten tým, který vede teď paní profesorka Válková, tedy musí přesvědčit českou veřejnost, že Istanbulská umluva není jenom o genderu, že nezasahuje do suverenity v tvorbě státního rozpočtu, protože všechny náklady spojené s implementací nese náš státní rozpočet. A my tedy budeme chtít mít ty politiky v čele, kteří budou podporovat opravdu služby, které skutečně, skutečně souvisí s odstraňováním násilí a s, pomoci, s pomocí skutečným obětem. Do suverenity musí přesvědčit... Ano, ke jsem dotazu, tady u toho například, to jsem promiňte, ale do suverenity našeho státu možná nejsou všechny jazyky na to tak citlivé, ale jestliže v usnesení Evropského parlamentu zní výzva, že máme mimo jiné prosazovat genderově neutrální jazyk, tak to člověk, který jehož mateřtina je čeština, prostě dělat nebude. A toto, toto je jeden, jedna z forem implementace. Dále musí, musíme být přesvědčeni, Pani Nováková, že, říkala jste, že, že nepodporu... snesete nějaké ano. dotazy. Takže buď to je krátký dotaz, dotaz další, ukončíme. poslední. Dota, Já už teda dotaz, končím. Ale, ale už bez komentáře, prosím. Uh, jste si jist... Dovolte, toto, tak to vypadá veřejná diskuse. Toto je zájení veřejné diskuse, v tomto tónu se to povede. Pani, pani ano, Rováková, budou máme, další máme mluvit. Deset, Chci máme jen říct, že v usnesení dotazky. rovněž je, a to nám vadí, že v souvislosti s implementací Istanbulské umluvy se také počítá s důsledným upra, upra, uplatňováním něčeho, čemu se zí, říká sexuální a reprodukční práva. A jestliže kolega ze Švédska řekl, že Istanbulská umluva je prorodiná, tak tak tady podle toho usnesení Evropského parlamentu je pro potratová. Tak, paní Nováková, to je všechno. Děkujeme. I don't think that we heard really a question. Uh, if, if, jestli chcete vznet dotaz, můžete. Dobrý den, Václav Černý, spolek Šalamoun. Já bych si jenom doved poznamenat, že Istanbulská umluva není jenom o fyzickém násilí, ale také o psychickém a finančním násilí a to je někdy daleko horší než ono fyzické násilí. A chtěl jsem se zeptat panelistů, je toto, jak je toto řešeno, jaká je rozhodovací praxe soudu a zdali k tomu existují nějaké statistiky. Děkuji. So if anybody of the panelists would like to uh, comment on uh, psychological violence in their respective contexts, if, if they've got any uh, good insights or recommendations. Uh, 
Well, I can share the Portuguese experience. Um, despite the fact that since two, the year 2000, uh, all forms of violence are integrated at the criminal code, the truth is that when there is no physical evidence of the violence, it's very hard to prove at the court that there was emotional violence, economic uh, deprivation, stalking, and so on and so on. So uh, the battle now is to, um, to give uh, value to the, narrative, to the speech of the victim despite the fact there, there, are, there is or there is not physical um, um, injuries that are uh, absolutely visible and uh, absolutely clear for everybody. So this is a, a challenge, I think, for most of the countries because uh, it's hard to measure, it's not impossible, but it's hard to measure the impact of psychological violence and there are um, uh, ways, um, forensic ways, to uh, help in this proof. The, so I think it's quite challenging, the, your question, but in Portugal it's a very hard job until now. Anybody else? It is true that uh, the convention contains more aspects, of course, wider ones. Um, again, my experience from my country is that the ratification of the convention helped, helped set in the governmental agendas women's issues that first were more difficult in finding space. Let me just give you an example. In Italy, the pay slip of a woman same function would amount roughly to 30% less than a man. So when you were referring to financial inequality and financial violence, uh, then this uh, came to me as an example. And I must tell you that although, again, it takes time, no instantaneous solutions, but still uh, there are measures undergoing in Italy in order to avoid this inequality. Again, another problem that we have in Italy, and I consider it to be a psychological violence if you want, is that many women are not able to work because simply they can, they're not able, there are no social services enough to put together working life with family life. They don't exist. There's never money to finance these social services. And so again, this has been has become a priority today. So the new government just set up last month in Italy had to say something, something to res with respect to that and to keep in mind that you cannot speak of equality ever unless you allow women to do what they like with respect of the rules and if they want to work, have them in the condition of working without having them to sacrifice the family or the other way around. But it takes money, a lot of money, <laughs> and money is always needed for other priorities, but it takes a lot of money. And it takes time, because the, the sensibility with respect to what a women's issue is, really is, that is not a challenge, but it's an opportunity, because women are resources for a civilization, uh, and should be fully <laughs> implied as resources, that takes time. And every minor step can help. But of course, it's a procedure, it's a process that is not a huge one, <laughs> but takes minor, minor, minor changes in behaviors. Changes in behaviors, mental behaviors, practical behaviors. And this, I think, my experience in my country, has slowly started at last. Thank you. The most popular question on Slido is one that I think uh, uh, resonates well with uh, what uh, Nina Novakova mentioned, uh, and that is uh, um, the problem of terminology. Um, uh, there uh, obviously uh, can't be uh, a simple definition or a uh, unanimously accepted definition of uh, terms like gender, gender stereotypes, or gender identity. But uh, what uh, it seems worries the uh, Czech public a lot is uh, that there would be uh, some kind of a gender conception uh, imposed on Czech society uh, because uh, of the Istanbul Convention. 
and uh, I think the best person to ask about uh, uh, these issues is, is Ferida Achar, uh, if she can uh, explain how uh, they have uh, in Gravio understood these terms and how they have applied it in uh, the uh, monitoring process. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know that I'm the best person, but I will try. <laughs> now, uh, um, as far as the definition of gender is concerned, this is perfectly clear in the Istanbul Convention and for Gravio. It is Article 3 of the Istanbul Convention, and I am reading verbatim from the Convention. Gender is socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that, that a given society considers appropriate for women and men. So the critical the, uh, point here is that this is socially constructed, and I am really surprised to see in some cases, not only here, everywhere, that uh, this notion of socially constructed uh, can be uh, difficult to understand or not readily acceptable to many people, but, but we all live in societies where our genders are socially constructed. Let's face it, 100 years ago was women uh, understood the same way that women uh, is understood today or in what uh, it means in one society today is it the same thing as in another society this is gender is not identical to uh, biological sex. And this is something that as a professor of political science and sociology, for instance, I've been teaching for 40 years. It's and not in uh, necessarily the most advanced uh, venues uh, in the world. So gender uh, and the Istanbul Convention's definition of gender is very clear. It refers to the socially constructed roles and attributes of women and men. And as it was uh, explained earlier this morning too, uh, it is the hierarchical construction of these, uh, the hierarchy that's inbuilt into this understanding that is detrimental, that is the uh, reason for inequality. And it is inequality that causes violence and violence further uh, um, uh, permeates inequality, further generates inequality. So it is this relationship that is at the heart of the Istanbul Convention, and that is what needs to be, I think, better um, understood, maybe. And as far as uh, gender stereotypes are concerned, again, it is the hierarchy, and it is also what, in the language of global. Uh, women's human rights in CEDAW language, what is called harmful stereotypes, harmful um, um, practices. For instance, the uh, notion that uh, of early marriage, that uh, women can get uh, married very early, uh, should get should be married very early in life, or forced marriage. These are things that emanate from gender stereotypes that are detrimental, that are harmful. And it is those that uh, these international instruments are working to, um, to disintegrate, to uh, make societies change. And as far as gender identity is concerned, in the Istanbul Convention, the term gender identity is only referred to once and in relation to uh, the, the article that states that there will be no, there should be no uh, discrimination on the basis of religion, political view, um, sex, and uh, gender identity is mentioned in that context. And let's face it, this is basic human rights. I mean, uh, do we want gender uh, Do we want a violation of human rights? And via, uh, do we want discrimination on the basis of gender identity? Of course we don't. No civilized society does. And to read anything more into this than what exists in the convention, I think, is rather unfair. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this explanation. I think the uh, Czech public might be relieved that uh, Gravio does not read uh, any uh, other things into, uh, into these definitions and these concepts. Um, Dámy a pánové, čas se nám nachýlil, proto je čas na to, aby jsme uzavřeli toto naše setkání. Myslím, že jsme se dozvěděli řadu zajímavých skutečností o tom, jakým způsobem je Istanbulská umluva 
naplňována v různých evropských zemích, které ji ratifikovaly již před několika lety. Zároveň jsme se dozvěděli, jakým způsobem přistupuje Rada Evropy, respektive nezávislý expertní orgán Grevio k ke kontrole nebo ke kontrole naplňování ustanovení této úmluvy. A myslím si, že je vhodné poděkovat všem našim panelistům dnešním za ty zkušenosti a za svůj čas, který nám věrovali. Thank you for all your contributions.